you know Sometimes This life can get rough You get knocked down, but You gotta get up Hello, I am Juliet McGratton, your host for this 261 Fearless Empowerment Talk. Now, 261 Fearless is a global network that uses running to unite and empower women all around the world. And we really believe that education is a critical part of this. So alongside our internal education programs for coaches and club directors, we bring you our series of empowerment talks. Now, join us as we speak to some wonderful women, women in roles of leadership and influence in the world of business, sport, health and more. Now, today I'm delighted to welcome the author, activist, athlete and award winning documentary filmmaker, Catherine Bertine. Now, Catherine had a really successful career as a pro cyclist three times Caribbean champion, six times the national champion for St. Kitts and Nevis. And she raced on the pro circuit for five years, retiring in 2017. But throughout this, Catherine has been and still is an activist for equality and inclusion of women in sport. One of her most notable achievements was securing the inclusion of a women's field in the Tour de France in 2015. Now, her fourth book, Stand, a memoir on activism, a manual for progress, which I've just finished reading, tells this story and her journey into activism. And it's this topic that we're going to focus on today. So welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me, Juliet. It's great to connect with you and to be here today. Oh, there was so much I could have wanted to say in the introduction, Catherine, but is there anything that I've missed out that you feel oh, no. people need to know to get to know you a bit better? No. <laughs> no, 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 you did awesome. And I feel that, uh, yeah, if there, if, oh my gosh, if people want to know any more about me, it's all in stand. It's a very, um, transparent book you would know more about me than you would ever care to in that book so <laughs> no I will leave it there you you said more okay. than enough <laughs> perfect uh, so as I said we want to talk about activism but I think maybe we should just start by what does that word actually mean to you because I know it can mean a lot of different things to different people but if someone says yeah. and you in your bio it says an activist what what do you mm -hmm. mean by that for me um there is a slight difference between advocacy and activism and activism, which sometimes can have a negative connotation. A lot of people fear that acting on something can be aggressive or, or you know, perceived in a difficult way. But in the reality, acting is putting your ideas out there into, or excuse me, action and activism is putting your ideas into just that. Acting and activism on your ideas is what makes things happen, as opposed to just thinking or, I don't know, maybe sending um, a, a passive voice of support, you know, but when you truly act, that's really what makes things happen. So uh, for me, I really do think that that activism comes from people who uh, engage on email, trying to get in touch with uh, the powers that be to make change happen, and then set up meetings and then have face to face interaction on how we make something happen. And that's really, truly what activism, how it starts. And uh, I think we also have to remind people that in this modern day and age, just uh, supporting something on social media, or liking or commenting, those are good steps but it's not actually stepping into the arena of change for what is possible and what we can do together. Mm, I hope that's yeah. a really long answer. No, it's great. It's a great <laughs> answer. It, 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 yes. You've got to, you've got to step up and, and do something to, and take some action to make a difference. Um, so, I mean, there's no doubt that you are an activist, but I'm wondering, did that, was that, are you an accidental activist or ah, did you actually se set out to become one? <laughs> oh, I think it happened um, in course. You know, it, so what I mean by that is that I never actually said, okay, I'm going to be an activist. This is how it's going to be. Um, 
but I did use my influence at the time. You know, I had, I had been a journalist with ESPN and I remember thinking, okay, if I'm a journalist, I know how to technically use my voice on pen, paper, et cetera, emails. Um, and as an athlete, I thought, okay, well, I'm at the professional level of cycling. So I can use that as a form of activism. I can engage with other professional cyclists around me to try to band together to create change. But did I ever go into it thinking like, oh, this is what I'm going to do? No. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that it was going to um, morph as it did, you know, from me being at one point like a category four bike racer, which is the beginner level, you know, in the States um, into an activist for a women's tour de France. I did not have any idea that that's the direction my, my life was going to go in at the start. Do you think that you, it was your destiny? Do you think anyone can become an activist or is it is it is it something in you that you need to have that's a great question um i do think that anybody can become an activist i really do, truly believe that if there's something that you believe in wholeheartedly whatever that might be and you stand up and fight for change um not violently fighting for change uh, <laughs> metaphorically. Um, absolutely, whatever it is that drives you, you definitely have the power to create change. And I say that from the perspective that, um, well, yes, I did have a training in journalism and I was a pro cyclist. I was not an Olympian. Mm -hmm. I was a, you know, not a world champion medalist. Um, I wasn't wealthy uh, and I sure as heck was not famous. You know, I'm not a movie star, but if, I were able to make all this change happen by being the instigator and creating uh, the team that made it happen, then it just proves that any of us can create change. And I always like to tell people too, you know, I live in Tucson, Arizona, which is a cycling hub of the world. But um, my, you know, running joke is that if I can create change in Paris from an apartment <laughs> in Tucson, then anybody can do anything. <laughs> So yes, everybody has the ability to, to make change happen and to be an activist. Mm -hmm. And do you think that there are particular characteristics that you need though? Are there parts of your personality that make it easier for you or harder for you to take um, on a challenge like that? Yeah, I will definitely say that if, you know, if you're going to fight for change, that does mean that you're going to be public about this mm -hmm. change. And let's talk about public for a minute. Like uh, for me, fighting for change at the Tour de France, that is something that the, the world follows, the world knows. So um, I put myself out there into the the world of cycling. And then it grew a little bit into, you know, um, rights for, for women on a global level. But if you wanted to fight for change in your local community, Yes, you might not have um, the world bearing down on your shoulders, but you might have daily interactions with people who are either for or against what you stand for. So I would say that uh, stepping into this world of, uh, or I should say wearing the hat of activism, one thing that it's really important to know is that you will face opposition. Uh, it might feel like what you stand for, you believe is common sense and everybody's gonna feel the same way that you do. Uh, as I did, I was like, look, all we want is for women to have an equal opportunity to compete where the men are competing. And at that time, it was, you know, 2009 when I first started this journey. So I'm like, it's 2009. Of mm -hmm. course, women are equal and women should have an equal opportunity. And to me, I had no idea how many people would oppose that. So where I bring this example into the realms of activism is... Um, you do have to have a thick skin and you have to be ready for opposition, even if what you believe in your heart and soul is um, something that just makes perfect sense, like equality for women, not everybody's gonna see that the same way. And um, that's what I would first tell anybody. You, you don't necessarily have to be a born activist. I, I never thought that I was, um, mm. but you do have to be ready for the opposition that you're gonna face. And if you know that ahead of time, it makes it that much easier to really, what you want to do is surround yourself with people who believe in your vision and your mission 
And that way it's not just a you against the world, it's a we against the world. And that mm-hmm. we is, um, it's like a big snuggly blanket, you know, <laughs> it's so much easier to fight for change when you have a group of like-minded individuals rather than just feeling that you're the only one or you're this center target. And, and sort of on that thing you're saying about the negativity and um, the criticism and other people's views, I know in the book you share a lot of the kind of internal conversations that were going on in your mind. And I have to admit that I, I, I read it and thought if I had that much criticism and negativity, I'm not sure how I would continue. So I, I, what was it that that made you? Because, I mean, I know you were campaigning for a long, long time before the race was included right what what made you or helped you you said that using we helped you to overcome some mm-hmm. of that negativity but were there other things that helped you to keep going absolutely I think a lot of time the criticism that I received um I I was willing to listen right to mm-hmm. to listen to the opposition because I wanted to know am I missing something you know and are my views off in some way And the more criticism that I heard about just how much it freaked people out that women also belonged at this race, the more it instilled the desire to keep pushing forward because none of their criticism really had anything based in um, my sense of reality, you know, for them to to be so angry that women were gonna be at a race was just silly, (laughs) right? So every time I got the negativity, I, it was a reminder that it was something that I needed to keep fighting for. I slash we needed to keep fighting for. Um, Because even though the negative voices sometimes feel the loudest, it was Mm -hmm. also very obvious to me how much support we had. Um, And sometimes those who support have that uh, kind of this idea of thinking like, oh yeah, no, what she's fighting for, it's common sense. I stand behind it, but they won't always use their their voice to back you, but they're like kind of silent supporters. So that's why it always feels like the critics are the are the loudest because mm-hmm. they're the ones that are gonna, you know, throw their little tantrums on whether it's social media or wherever. And um, it took some getting used to understanding that there is a lot of support out there. And when you ask for it, you'll see a lot more people stand up and be like, oh yes, of course I support this. So one of the things that our group did was we rallied the troops behind the scenes saying, you know, asking for support. And so many people were very willing to give it, but it wasn't until we asked. How did you feel about asking? Did you feel comfortable about it or I did. It you felt awkward? <laughs> no, no, I felt very comfortable reaching out. And it wasn't just me too. You know, this was our, our group, and which included Chrissy Wellington, Mariana Voss and Emma Pooley, um, so for all of us asking for um, for support, we got tons of it, you know, because it was modern day times. And um, there are plenty of men and women that thought absolutely common sense. Of course, women should be allowed to race at the Tour de France, you know, so um, it didn't bother me to ask. It wasn't that, you know, the other thing is interesting, too. It's not that we were necessarily asking for um, financial donations or. Um, we were asking people to convert their religious belief. You know, it, it, it wasn't a topic that seemed in our minds very, um, very difficult. It was just, oh, it wasn't like we were asking for a women's race to replace the men's race. You know, we wanted one in addition to. So coming back to that basic knowledge of, of um, believing in what we were fighting for made it a lot easier to, to ask for support and, and help along the way. And I know uh, you mentioned those incredible women that you worked with there to achieve your aim, but to start with, it was, it was you, it was your baby and the team that you had around you, I know you called it Le Tour Entier. Um, how difficult was it to invite people into that inner circle and into what was kind of your campaign to start with? Uh, I can answer that in two parts. So the first part was, it was very, very easy to ask um, some of my heroes in sport who Mm -hmm. already wanted to be part of it. So uh, Chrissy Wellington, who many of you know, especially in the UK, you know, is four-time Ironman world champion. 
She wanted to be part of it. No problem. Great. Um, Emma Pooley, again, Olympic medalist and multiple time world champion in cycling. Um, she was so outspoken and so for it. It was great. Mariana Voss, known as the GOAT, the greatest of all time in cycling. Um, Dutch woman. She's amazing. I, her, I can't even count the amount of Olympic and world medals that she has combined. It's something like up in the 20s or 30s of like how many wins this woman has is amazing. So the four of us coming together, that was very easy. That was absolutely um and, you know, then you look at my Palmars in the sport and yes, I do have a couple national titles, but I don't have Olympic medals. I don't have world championship medals. And what I did have and what I was very good at was becoming the organizer and becoming the, um, the instigator, so to speak, doing some of the work behind the scenes, drafts of this and that, you know, making things happen that way. But it also goes to show that uh, we all have that capability. We don't need, we don't all need that world title, right? We can make stuff happen. Mm -hmm. So that worked for our initial group, but I did struggle later on when um, we very much needed to consider bringing in a few other people who had direct connections to the head honchos at the Tour de France. So Marianne Quinet, um, Steve Beckett, Christy Scrimger, um, Tracy Pinder, who ended up being amazing because she was like a PR rep for us. So we brought others in, um, but there was some strife and some struggle because I, uh, I didn't know all mm -hmm. of these four new members coming in and I'll leave this for those who read the book, but, um, you know, one specifically became, uh, pretty difficult to work with. And I remember having this feeling of angst of like, okay, there are some good points you've brought. There are some good things you're doing in our group, but you're also um, not jiving, jiving, jiving with our, our group's mission. And so that was a real struggle for me. Um, but, you know, I also had to remember that I really did have the support of the vast majority in that group. So maybe one isn't, you know, you don't see eye to eye with one, maybe that's okay. And I think that's an important life lesson. If we ever do create a group, I, I give people the advice, if you're gonna fight for change, surround yourself and create a group with uh, a small number of people, like four is a great number, yourself included. You know, when it gets bigger than that, you have to be very careful and you have to watch out mm -hmm. for struggle or opposition. And if that comes into play, how's it gonna affect your group dynamic? But I feel that that core group of uh, four people is something to start with and leave it there if you, if you need to. You don't have to make it bigger if it's effective and it's working. But uh, yeah, it definitely produced some strife along the way. So it was a, it was a growing experience. <laughs> <laughs> could, you, yeah. could you have done it on your own? Do you think no. other, people, other people can do it on their own? Um, how about yes and no? It depends on what it is you're... you're specifically mm -hmm. shooting for, right? If you want to go into politics, like that's a very solo adventure, but yet you need the support of your voters behind you, right? So yes, you could go into politics alone, knowing that you need the support of your uh, you know, voters, but to create something really big, like having women at the Tour de France, that's a both singular, but also multifaceted dimension mm -hmm. of how many people are you talking to? What's going on behind the scenes? I know that for me, I wouldn't have been able to do this alone because I tried <laughs> and yeah, sure. it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at first in 2009, when I was fighting for change um, behind the scenes, you know, I was the one sending emails to Christian Prudhomme, the, you know, head of the ASO Tour de France ownership, you know, I was, I was the one sending emails and I wasn't getting anywhere. Nobody was getting back to me when I tried doing this all by myself. But when I banded together, that's when ASO looked at the, uh, you know, the power of who was sitting next to me and they couldn't ignore us. Mm. So I think that, um, you know, I tell everyone, you know, yes, I might've been like, chief instigator operator behind this, but we wouldn't have gone anywhere if it were a solo effort. It was the team effort that made this happen. Yeah, yeah. And do you think, um, I think 
you gave up so much <laughs> I, I don't want to ruin the book, <laughs> but you you gave up, a, you made a lot of sacrifices on the way to reaching this. Do you want to share what some of those were? And I'm wondering if if everybody who's becoming an activist or wants to make progress and stand up for change, should they expect to have to make sacrifices? I I think you're asking a great question, and I'm also going to get super technical here. So. Mm -hmm. I don't think I made any sacrifices. I think I made choices. And there really is a true definition between sacrifice and choice. You know, um, mm -hmm. sacrifice is uh, almost, you know, it, even the definition itself, it's like you, you are giving up your life for something else that, and that other else can then succeed and thrive. And for me, um, I think the difference between choice and sacrifice, like I didn't step in front of a train to save a baby, you know, that's a sacrifice, right? But a choice is willingly saying, I'm going to stand for what I believe in. And what comes from that will, will be, I don't know what that's going to be, but whatever comes from that, I am willingly making this choice. And so for me, um, choice and sacrifice do have that difference. So. Um, the other thing too, that we have to remember when we make choices to do things, um, we don't know how the other parties involved might react or respond and that could have a direct impact on our life, right? So um, that happened to me in, in uh, standing for what I believe. And I, I don't, I'm trying to like talk where I'm not giving away too much in the book, mm -hmm. but yet, you know, it's also kind of on the, on the cover or the, the, the back cover when you read, you know, you know that uh, there is a divorce that's going to happen during this journey. Of course, I didn't know that at the time, but for me, I was never actually given the choice of a spouse saying it's either your activism or me, you know, mm -hmm. um, I made choices for what I thought was best for all involved. And if somebody chooses to leave, um, I can't count that as a, a sacrifice. That's somebody else's choice, right? So it's a really fascinating dynamic of um, what, did it, what happens when we stand on those front lines of change. And I will say, and I even say this, you know, in the beginning of the book, we have to be ready. If we are going to stand up for what we believe, um, and it's in a public setting as a Tour de France is, uh, we have to understand that our personal world, our personal life, our personal world can be affected just as much as the public world. So that's not something I fully understood was going to happen until I was already you know, in, in the activism itself. And I wouldn't change anything at all. That was going to be my next question. Would, would you would you have done anything differently? Would you would you do it again? <laughs> I would. Um, I would even that that was something that I had to come to peace with and to terms with in terms of my own personal healing and clothe, closing. You know this chapter. Um, would I have done this again? And it took years to get to that point and to really examine and do the deep dive. You know behind the scenes of. Um, what would I have done differently? Is there anything I would have done differently? And the only times where I would say, oh yeah, sure. There are parts of the activism I would have done differently. Um, you know, for example, I would have started with a, a group at the very beginning rather than mm -hmm. just myself, right? Um, so there are tiny things that knowing the journey I would have maybe done differently, but those are all very technical aspects. Um, and if I had to do the whole thing over again as is, knowing that that was my only choice, you know, I would. Um, because I think in the end, it's uh, the best thing if, when you stand for what you believe, if you surround yourself with people who see your mission, whether that's personal life or private life, um, it's what you have to, what you have to do. And um, it's, it's been worth it. I'm now at the place in my life where I can say the, the struggle is worth the journey. And there were times during that journey that I could not have said that. So it takes time to really let that come into full focus and how did it feel when you were cycling down the Champs-Élysées <laughs> did, did uh, you feel did you feel like that was it success or did, did it feel like just one more step in the journey 
Oh, um, I think at the time, well, I was actually on the bike encircling the Champs. It was great. Like it was success fully. Like we got there. I was there. I was, I was doing everything that I hoped we could create and achieve for women. So yes, there was a lot of success in that very moment um, as an athlete, but as a human inside, I was very broken. I was mm -hmm. absolutely crushed at what was happening in my personal life. And I just, I would say like a month or two before um, the 2014 uh, La Course by Tour de France with, for women, um, I, I had to almost wear two hats or two masks, as I say in the book, my, uh, my public self and my private self had uh, done a, a deep disconnect there. And I felt that um, that was what was best for me at the time, you know, be the strong woman to talk about the Tour de France and all the amazing success and the gains that we had had, you know, that um, I had to wear that mask in public, but behind the scenes, I was just a crying mess of, um, emotional, you know, distraughtness. <laughs> it was, <laughs> I can't think of any other way to say it than I was just a mess. Um, but I couldn't show that side to the camera. Um, I wasn't ready to, and it, the unfortunate part of that is that it really, um, you know, I don't think that we as human beings can ever sustain wearing two masks, you know, mm -hmm. or any mask, any number, even one mask, you know, um, peace really comes when we feel that we're able to be authentically who we are. And that time in my life, I felt like I was two different people like this strong public advocate for women's equality and then a crying mess on the floor in my personal life. So I don't recommend having to wear any sort of mask. Um, and for anyone who's gone through their own personal struggle, I know they know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, there's only so much the public should know compared to what the private should private sector of your life might be going through. But it's a tough thing if you are currently in the media's eye. And I was at that time, you know, because we have succeeded what we set out to do. So um, while I'm by no means famous, I was very much in the public eye of the Tour de France and sports world at that time, you know, fielding all of these calls from you know, uh, BBC, CNN, all of the giant news sources. And I had to wear a certain face for that. Um, but it wasn't my true face. Just picking up on something you said there about, you know, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't, I wasn't famous. And I know that the other women in your core team, as you said yourself, you know, had, had a lot more Olympic medals and titles and yeah. things to their name. Was, was that difficult being the, the, the instigator, but also the least well-known of the group? Um, great question. And it's a yes and no answer. Um, it was funny to me in the beginning, it was very, very funny when, um, and this usually happened in the sports news industry. They would look at, at Chrissy, Mariana, Emma, and myself, and they would sometimes just list the first three and just completely leave me off the article, you know, um, and, or they would, you know, spell my name wrong or get my, you know, my facts or what I had done or achieved wrong. I'll never forget at the actual Tour de France, they had our whole group up on a screen, not Chrissy, she was spectating because she's a triathlete. She wasn't a, a mm -hmm. pro cyclist, yeah. but they had Emma and Marianne and me. And for the first two, they had um, uh, all the awards and world championships and titles that those two had had achieved. And then for me, um, they it had one word, maybe it was two, but it, it said like Catherine Bertine, writer, cyclist, <laughs> you know, and I, I was just like, oh, okay. You know, so part of it made me laugh um, because it was funny and it was true. They could have done a better job, but I had to take it, you know, kind of like take it on the chin, as they say, with uh, just like, it doesn't matter. We got what we achieved or we, we got what we were going for. We achieved this dream. That's all that really matters. Um, mm -hmm. So that part of it, I was, I was okay with. The only time that I wasn't okay with it was when one of the members of our group um, tried to exclude me 
from, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit vague because I think it's, a, <laughs> I know it's you know, the part in the book, but I, I think that that's such a poignant, important part of the book that I want to like leave that for the readers to experience. Mm -hmm. But when you create this group and then one, actually it happened twice, right? One person um, really tried to leave me out of what was happening. And then um, a second person later on also did the same thing. And that, that cut me to the core, you know, and my inner child was like, this is my group. You know, how dare you leave me out of my group? Like it's my group. And it was really, uh, really personal. So I was able to laugh at the public and the media, but I was not at all okay or laughing if within the group, I felt um, like somebody had made me feel less than, you know? Mm -hmm. And it did change when I stood my ground. Again, you know, like, hey, you're not leaving me out of this but it just hurt that I even had to get to that point to actually say that out loud. Like it never should have had to be said, um, but it was a really good experience. And then the, the person who first left me out, um, it was also a good lesson to be like, look, if this happens in a friendship, do you, what do you do? You know, does that mean the end of the friendship or is this a bump in the road that you figure out together? And it really turned out to be the latter. So it was kind of a good life lesson to be like, okay, just because we disagree um, and we have this, uh, you know, this thing that makes somebody feel really bad, can we make up and can our friendship survive? And um, in one case it did. And for the other person, it didn't matter. That was, you know, we weren't friends to begin with, so it was okay. <laughs> but uh, life lessons, man, adulting, it's hard. <laughs> I was going to say it's easy to look in back in hindsight and, and think yeah dealing dealing with conflict best way to overcome those situations your different roles yeah. as a friend and then within the team and uh, I guess yeah it's just being able to learn from it <laughs> oh for sure for sure and yeah it's a it's an interesting thing like I mentioned that we want we definitely want to surround ourselves with people who believe and support and what it is that we stand for but it's also so important to listen to the opposition and to be able to engage with them in a healthy way um, and to help educate us, you know, on how does the other side feel about this? And if they have a valid point, then fantastic. It can make the whole movement grow, you know, in the right direction. But if they're just like whining and yelling and their point has no validity, then that's something you have to learn to accept and mm -hmm. just kind of brush off, but um, opposition ultimately is a great thing because it will challenge you to keep standing for what you believe, or maybe it goes the other direction and you think, oh yeah, actually they have a good point. Maybe I need to reconsider. I think that's rare, but it's very important that, um, that we do have people who are, who we, who are opposed to our beliefs and then how do we deal with them? Mm. You know, I think in today's modern day and age, if someone doesn't agree with you, I, I don't think we have the tolerance as we used to, to engage in the concept of agreeing to disagree. Be like, okay, yeah. I don't believe what you believe. You don't believe what I believe, but can we coexist and be kind and maybe find a solution that's somewhere in the middle? Um, I would like to see more of that return to the world because I think we're lacking mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Compromise, yeah. Mm -hmm. So working in a team, listening to the opposition seeing choices rather than sacrifices are there any other tips that you can pass on to those listening to this who are who believe they want to make some change and, and pursue a target like yours yeah um well we can talk a little about social media you know use social media as your ally but not your platform right that's a that's a really big one and I always feel that that's so relevant today, more than more than ever. You know, um, don't uh, don't bug your opposition on social media. Like, find out their email address, their telephone number, have a direct conversation. Don't engage in social media back and forth. Uh, that can um, that can just come across all wrong. It's it's you know it's not uh, it's not the most productive way to do something. 
um, and certainly never use sarcasm. That gets really lost in the cracks, especially on social media. People don't know you. They don't know if you're if you're being funny or trying to make a joke. Um, sarcasm is something that can always backfire. So you know, just avoid that and stick directly to your mission. One of the things that we did with La Tour Antier was we, it wasn't just a petition that we put out to ASO for the Tour de France. It was a website, it was a manifesto, it was a very detailed explanation of what we were doing and what we stand for. And at the heart of that was that we were willing to come and sit down with ASO and make this happen together which is a very big deal as opposed to just saying to whether it's a politician or, you know, a company saying, Hey, I think you should make change happen. Like that's weak, (laughs) you know, no, be a willing participant and offering what you can do to make this change happen with them as opposed to just, you know, saying, do this, do that. No, sit down and prove to them. We actually, and this is very obvious, you'll, you'll encounter this throughout many chapters and stand how nearly ridiculous it was, how much we, especially as women, had to prove that what we were fighting for um, would make sense or was a good option. You know, So we had to actually prove why including women at a race would matter socially, economically, you know, all of it. And I'm sitting there like, oh my God, (laughs) okay. But when you, the reason I'm like this is because men don't have to prove that. When have you ever heard of a man have to prove like, well, it would be a good thing. I'm gonna prove to you why we deserve to have a race, a function or whatever it is. No, it's just seen as common sense. So, you know, we need to get to that place where our, our gender, our sex can also have the same equal opportunity. And it's, that was a big one for me of how hard we had to fight to prove why we mattered. So um, I went a little off topic there. No, it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that, we, that's we need to hear it. <laughs> right. And if you're going to stand up and fight for change, be ready mm. to prove what mm. you think is already obvious. Mm. Yeah. It's a lot of work. <laughs> What are you working on now? Ah, yeah. So I am working on uh, my next book. Um, This is going to be one that's a little bit personal in a different way. Obviously, fighting for the Tour de France, that was very public. And in stand, there's a lot of my personal life that was happening behind the scenes. But this next book is like very personal. It's a journey that, um, that I shared with my father. We had been on a hiking journey called high pointing in the uh, United States, which is going to the highest point of each state. Sometimes that's like a sidewalk or a cornfield. Sometimes <laughs> that's a very big mountain, depending on the state. Um, and we started this back in the nineties when I was in college and we always said, we get back to it. We get back to it. And when my father retired out to Tucson, um, we did get back to it. However, uh, the pandemic interfered, of course, but we were like, wait, we can still go outside. So we started drawing up where we would go next. Um, and then my father passed away. And for me, that was, you know, he was just, he was my best friend. We were so close. And for me, trying to find a way through the grieving process, um, I decided that I would finish the mountains that we hadn't gotten to um, in his lifetime, but I would bring a little bit of his ashes to all the states that we still had left. Mm -hmm. And I did. So I was able to finish that journey. And um, I I would say, I never intended like, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to write about it. What a great idea. You know, (laughs) it wasn't until like halfway through, it took me two years to finish the rest of the journey. And it was about halfway through that, that I finally kind of took a look around. I'm like, there are so many interesting things on this trip. It's not just about walking or hiking or climbing to the high point that in fact, writing just about that would get boring, you know, but it's the people that you meet along the way, fascinating characters. The fact that this was happening during the pandemic added another layer, but there was such an interesting history too, to this high point story. And um, there's so many of these facets that came together. It's like, I think there's more here than just um, a daughter grieving her father, but there's some really fascinating substance 
that uh, that I'd like to tell the world about. And um, rather than being something sad, it's really something joyful about you know not hap- not what happens when someone dies, but what happens when we truly live. So this is the book I'm working on now. Um, I'm very much in the early stages of the first draft. So, you know, um, it'll be another couple of years. Thank you. (laughs) Writing, you know, what's funny in this modern day and age, I think because of how short our collective attention spans have gotten, you know, people think like, oh, you're working on a book. So when's it done? Like next month? Like, Mm -hmm. no, no. You know, you can write a news article in a day. You could write a, you know, a long form article in weeks, but it takes years to write a book. So I'm I'm uh, in the throes as we speak. Well, we'd definitely be looking out for it. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much, Juliet. Yeah, thank you for, well, for what you've done for women, what you've done for women cycling, for an, pursuing such a, an amazing oh target that's made the world a better place and for everything that you continue to do and also Aww. for speaking to us here today it's been really um a pleasure and an honor and thank you so much Catherine well I am so honored thank you for such great questions Juliet and I love our 261 fearless team out there across the world and I'm proud to be part of it looking forward to the New York City Marathon so I'll be there oh, in spirit. Fantastic. <laughs> wearing this awesome shirt. <laughs> so thank you, thank so you much. for all you do. All right. Thank Have you. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye.